Okay, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. I know some people are still trickling in, but we're so glad that you could be here. My name is Ellie Garrity and I'm the manager of alumni career programs with the Alumni Association. Again, we're so excited that you're able to join us for today's 2020 Robert E. Fischel Lecture, The Challenges of Drug Development During COVID-19 with Dr. Murdad Parsi. This webinar is in partnership with the College of Computer, Mathematical, and Natural Sciences and the University of Maryland Alumni Association. This webinar is being recorded and will be sent out to all registrants. We have a lot of information to cover today, but if you want to get the most out of this webinar, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing the Dean of the College of Computer, Mathematical, and Natural Sciences at the University of Maryland, Dean Amitabh Varshne. Dean Varshne, please take it away. Thank you, Ellie. Um, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Robert E. Fischel Lecture, a fireside chat with Dr. Merdad Parsi, a Terp and the Chief Medical Officer of the Gilead Sciences. We are very grateful to Robert Fischel and his wife, Susie, who endowed this lecture and are on the webinar with us today. Dr. Fischel earned his master's degree in physics here at Maryland in 1953 and went on to create the modern era of space satellites and invent life-saving medical devices. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and holds more than 200 patents. In 1996, Dr. Fischel was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Maryland. And in 2016, he received the National Medal of Technology and Innovation from President Obama. You may know him as the namesake at the university's Fischel Department of Bioengineering, where he holds the title Professor of Practice. We are so proud of Dr. Fischel's achievements and grateful for his and Susie's support of this university. Thank you, Bob and Susie. And now it is my pleasure to turn this over to Professor Janice Roit Robbie, Chair of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Janice. Well, well welcome everyone. And um, thanks, thank you all for joining us today. It's my pleasure to now introduce our distinguished moderator, Dr. Dorothy Beckett, and the 2020 official lecturer, Dr. Murdad Parsi. Dr. Beckett is a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry who has taught and trained several generations of Maryland biochemists, including many in this audience. A biophysical chemist, she researches the regulation of protein functions, elucidating mechanisms of biological importance. She also has a very keen interest in science and education policy, which she act actively pursues in her professional roles as professor, journal editor, and past president and very active member of the Biophysical Society. Today, Dr. Beckett will be speaking with Dr. Murdad Parsi. I am pleased to say that Dr. Parsi grew up in Maryland and is an alumni of our department. He earned his BS degree in biochemistry and doubled in and did a double major in microbiology at UMCP in the mid-1980s. People often ask me, what can I do if I earn a degree in biochemistry? The answer to that, judging from Dr. Murdad Parsi's career tra trajectory, is that you can do a lot. Um, upon his graduation, he earned both his MD and PhD degrees at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And following a residency in internal medicine and additional training, he went on to take on drug development roles within the biotechnology industry, including at Genentech, where he served as president and CEO of 3V Biosciences. Currently, he serves as the chief medical officer at, at Gilead Sciences, where he oversees the company's global, global clinical development and medical affairs organizations. I am so pleased that Dr. Parsi joins us today to speak about the challenges of drug development during COVID-19. I'll turn it over to Dr. Beckett and Dr. Parsi now. Thank you. So, well, welcome, uh, Dr. Parsi. Um, I 
Before we start, I think, uh, I know, talking about the topic at hand, which is the challenge of drug development during COVID or the challenges during COVID-19. Uh, first, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your very, must, what must be a very busy schedule to talk with us about this topic, which I think will be of great interest to many people. Um, I also, um, before getting into the topic, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is it, and I think this would be of interest to many of our students, um, what is it that led you to pursue this path as, as opposed to uh, being a career as a clinician or a clinician scientist? First, thanks for inviting me. I really am flattered and I, I have to say, I never thought I'd be doing this. So I really uh, appreciate the invitation and it's great to be back in touch with uh, folks at College Park. Um, uh, and I, I do wanna thank the Fischels also for their, for their support for this lecture. I'm, I'm very flattered and honored to be here. So thank you for that. Um, it's a great question. I can tell you that when I was 20 years old and, and you know, it, it, uh, an undergrad, it was, um, it was never in my plan to be doing what I'm doing today. I didn't even think I was going to be a clinician um, at that time. I was mostly interested in research. That was my that was my plan for my career was to be a bench scientist and and um, you know go in that direction. Um, what what changed for me is when I was um, doing my clinical training and I was um, taking care of patients in the intensive care unit. My my fellowship was in. Um, pulmonary and critical care. And I um, was doing basic research at the time as well during my fellowship, as well as um, uh, doing clinical care. And I just got my, my first uh, NIH grant and was um, on that path. And what I was doing is at the same time, I was participating in enrolling patients into clinical trials. And um, it was really my first exposure um, to being involved in any way in clinical trials. And at the time it was for new therapies for patients in the intensive care unit. Um, uh, people who were in the ICU, who, you know, the mortality rate usually in the ICU, um, the death rate is usually around 30% or so once people end up in the intensive care unit. So we were heavily involved in a number of uh, studies, NIH studies, other, um, you know, pharmaceutical uh, studies. And I just really got excited about it because what it was really what I realized I'd always wanted to do, which was to understand biology and uh, try to impact human care, right? And have an impact on your patients. And what I often say is, you know, as a, as a clinician, you, you do patient by patient, you do individual by individual, which is fantastic, but, you know, I, I don't want to um, minimize that you you interact especially in the intensive care unit uh, unlike other a lot of other places with people's families and especially at a very hard time in their lives what I realized is um, I, I cared about the impact uh, a lot and um, when you are able to do um, clinical trials more broadly and uh, design the study and do it globally you're able to have an impact instead of patient by patient, you know, disease by disease, which is, which is um, really exciting. So I made the transition back then and it's been, it, you know, certainly been a, a very interesting um, past 20, so year, 20 or so years where, you know, I, I have medicines that I've developed that my children take, um, you know, and now with COVID, you know, with, um, with what's going on, you know, that, that direct impact is really palpable. And, and I never thought I'd be doing it. And, uh, and yet it's been a fantastic, um, uh, you know, uh, way to, you know, develop my career and, and feel like I have an impact um, yeah. on, on patients. And what a time this is uh, yeah. to have that kind of impact. Um, I'm sure, sure you never could have envisioned this. So um, what exactly does a chief medical officer at a, at, at a major pharmaceutical company do? Um, so um, it's a very broad role. Um, it, it, it involves a number of things. Uh, first and foremost, it's about patient safety. Um, um, you're the person who is accountable for, responsible for the safety of patients, either in clinical trials or on medicines that are, um, you know, in our portfolio and uh, medicines that we have. Um, so that's probably the most important part of the role. Um, in addition to that, then uh, I oversee the um, the people who are involved in 
designing and uh, conducting trials um, from the time we go first into humans to um, a time when a drug is approved. Um, and, uh, you know, usually I have to explain what that all is, but these days everybody's sort of on the <laughs> forefront of watching that happen in real time. So you all see it, you know, like the vaccines, for example, that are in people for the first time and then, you know, go through the different phases of development. I usually have to talk about what phase one, two, and three are, but you've probably read it in the paper now. Um, and then up, up until approval. And uh, of course, um, most of what we do fails. Uh, almost 85% uh, almost of what we start uh, with uh, never makes it um, uh, to approval. Um, but we're involved in that sort of long and arduous process. The, the, I think what's interesting about what's happening now, especially as people see the vaccine development and, and even remdesivir, you know, you get this impression that everything can be done in a few months or, or you know, six months. But in usually most things that we work on take about seven or eight years. That's, that's usually the average. And um, so it's very rare to be involved with the molecule from the time it comes into patients first till it gets approved. It's a very rare privilege to be able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to sort of move into the topic of the, of the day, um, I just wondered if you would just give an overview to the audience of the steps of developing a drug, since it's the challenge of drug de development, the steps in developing a drug from the discovery stage to the approval. Sure. Um, and, and again, I think it's, it's great that everyone now has some exposure to what we do, I think, with, with what's going on. Um, the, it's, it's usually very complicated uh, in the sense of it re we really start with basic research. We start with what uh, you're all familiar with, and that is, the, that is the foundation upon everything, upon which everything is built. We have a very uh, big research group, uh, almost every company does. Uh, who really focus on basic science. We work very closely with folks in academics and uh, around the world as well, um, working with them when there's an idea or a target or some biology that becomes available that, that we think could have impact on human life. Of course, um, the hard part is taking those, um, not the hard part, one of the hard parts is taking that research and seeing how it applies in people. And so what we usually do is we, um, uh, you know, you, you work through the preclinical models you, to get to the point and the preclinical toxicology to make sure that you are comfortable with the safety of a molecule in preclinical models. But then we start very small, very slowly um, in what's called phase one development, which is where we see uh, when, we, when we give a medicine, how much uh, of that medicine gets absorbed, for example, if it's oral, you know, how much a patient is exposed to it and make sure that it's safe. Um, that's, that's a really key um, uh, component there, um, and which is why we start very small. And then from there, we go to phase two, which is where we now test the actual biology that we're interested in. Um, and that's the most humbling phase of drug development where you, you think you know what you're testing, um, you try uh, a medicine in a patient population and it doesn't work the way you expected it to work or it doesn't work at all, um, or it works in a disease you didn't expect it to work in. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's the most humbling part of biology. And one of the things I love about what we do is uh, I think we learn a lot about biology in, in a sense it's applied biology in that, that translational bit. So, uh, so that's phase two. And then if a medicine works in that phase two, uh, we have to do one more thing, which is to establish that we know how much of the drug to give, um, how much of the medicine is enough to get the benefit you want without getting side effects um, that you don't want. Um, so we do what's called dose range finding. And then finally, we go into what are called registrational trials or phase three. Um, phase three is the largest and most complicated and most time consuming part of, um, of the process where now you go and you, you um, demonstrate in a larger patient uh, population, a larger group of patients, that the medicine is effective, it's safe, or at least you understand what the side effects are, 
and specifically how it's effective. What, what endpoints, what um, benefits you think you can bring to people. And, uh, and that's what leads to when you see an FDA label, the, the in, what's called the indication statement that is based on what you tested in phase three. So if you're testing a medicine for blood pressure, you, your primary endpoint is blood pressure, you test it and you show that you decrease blood pressure and that, that's what gets into your label. Obviously when you're enrolling thousands of patients, you, uh, you do as much as you can to characterize the medicine as much as you can across the board. Whether it's um, safety or efficacy, you try to get all that information. And that gets you to then to applying for um, approval with regulatory bodies, either here in the US or outside the US. And they, they obviously are very rigorous and, and look through all of the information that you provide them. It usually takes about a year for them to review all the data. Um, and, then, uh, and then you either get approval or not and, and, and uh, the drug uh, becomes available then at that point. So that's kind of the process end to end. And so if we think about COVID and its impact on drug development, what stages or are all of these stages affected by the COVID pandemic? And if so, how? Yeah, it's been, a, it's been incredibly compressed, right? I think that the, compared to what we would usually do in terms of taking years to do those things, because all of those stages take years and years to do, um, it's been really compressed. Now we were, um, with remdesivir, we were in a, a unique position in that that medicine had been um, developed, and this gets back to sort of the, the, the value and the power of basic science. Um, it had been um, developed as a, as a very broad spectrum antiviral, so a medicine that could hit multiple viruses. Um, and initially, uh, a few of the viruses that, that we were interested in, this is before I joined Gilead, so um, uh, I, don't, I won't take any credit for it, um, were SARS and MERS, which are other coronaviruses, and Ebola, which is not a coronavirus, but we knew we had some activity. Um, and so the medicine had already been through phase one and some small phase two studies, but um, with those studies, it was actually very difficult to conduct them. SARS and MERS, unlike COVID-19, came and went. If you recall, when they first came out, they came out and then they were pretty much gone. They, they, there really weren't a lot of patients. And Ebola is another disease that has flares and then it goes away. And um, in the first phase two study, very small phase two study we did with remdesivir, it didn't really work. It didn't really bring a benefit to patients with Ebola. Um, we can talk about why that might be. Um, and so we were in the position where we had enough medicine for about 5,000 patients in January when coronavirus first started uh, um, coming out and we started seeing it. Um, and like everyone else, we had no idea where things were gonna go. Um, uh, and uh, we were therefore able to move very quickly into the studies to establish essentially the phase three studies. It was a lot of compressed development at that point. We were very closely, um, and in, in fact, probably the most, uh, the, the key partner with us was the um, NIH, the, the NIAID part of NIH, uh, which uh, interestingly, we have a, a number of people who used to be at NIAID who work at Gilead now, who, so we were very fortunate to have those, those um, connections. And in addition to the NIAID trials, we worked with investigators in China, investigators at the WHO, and then our own trials, uh, multiple uh, studies that we did. So in parallel, we, uh, we ramped up um, probably something like uh, eight trials, I would say, something like that, uh, in that ballpark at least, um, simultaneously to, to basically establish, does it work? Is it safe? Uh, what, and importantly, what patients does it work in, right? Uh, does it work in the mildest patients? Does it work in the sickest patients? Because in, in the past with antiviral drugs, usually if you're very sick, it doesn't work. It really works very early on in the infection, um, uh, because usually the infection, the viral infection happens early, and then it's the inflammatory response that causes people to end up in the ICU. And that's essentially what we're seeing with remdesivir as well. I'm sorry, with COVID as well. Um, it, you know, a lot of people will get that early viral infection. Most people do fine, 
some people get sick and, and it's a combination of the virus and their immune response that's making them sick enough to get into the hospital. We didn't know um, how patients um, were gonna progress with the disease at all. We didn't know uh, what per percent of patients, for example, were gonna get severe disease, what percent of patients were gonna end up in the ICU. Uh, we were riding along with everyone else um, with a lot of uncertainty about what this virus would do. Um, and so we did very broad studies with very broad populations of patients to see, does it work in early disease, as in the middle, late disease, where do you have to uh, get them? And then what actually happens, we didn't know what was going to happen to patients at that time um, who got infected and what were we looking for? What benefit could we bring? Um, which is unusual in drug development, right? And usually you've done earlier work that you kind of know, you know, who it's going to work in and, and what the disease is you're even fighting. Um, and that was a very unique situation. And I think something, as, as you all know, we're still learning about the virus. We were talking earlier about some of the other uh, effects that the virus has on people. Um, so we did, uh, you know, we were able to bring that and not us alone. I think everyone, uh, you, you, I don't want to, I don't want to say this was all Gilead. It certainly by no means was, as you've been reading, everyone was doing the same thing. Um, we were lucky enough to, to have remdesivir on the shelf and able to, to do those trials. And then some of the other medicines that have been really effective, for example, steroids, sexamethasone, that have been around for a long time, very easy to pull off the shelf and, and test. So that, that was also n hydroxychloroquine, also on the shelf, easy to pull down and test. Um, so a lot of work going on in parallel uh, with a lot of different agents to try to see what would happen. We were fortunate. We saw, we were, uh, you know, been able to show um, a signal and that got us to that initial regulatory approval. And in a matter of months, I, in my entire career, I've never been involved in anything like this, where you go from not knowing the disease in January to an emergency use authorization in, in May. Um, it, it is truly a unique time. Uh, we're you know, I feel lucky to have been involved, certainly not, not in the plan, as you asked earlier, right? Do you plan for these things? You don't plan for these things, they happen. And it was definitely, a, uh, it's been a, a real privilege to be involved in it, but it's all been very condensed. Now you're seeing that same thing happen on the vaccine side, right? Um, and that's lagged. And the reason that's lagged is unlike uh, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, or or uh, steroids, they didn't exist in January. And so people had to understand the virus before they could make the vaccines and then start making the vaccines at scale in order to get to being able to even conduct those initial trials. Um, uh, one contrast, I think, between remdesivir and the vaccines, the vaccines are a lot easier, believe it or not, to make. Um, you can make a lot of vaccine very quickly. For us, it takes about nine months to make any remdesivir. So all of the drug up until um, roughly August was medicine that we had on the shelf already that we could get out to about 150,000 patients. Uh, we had to start manufacturing in January and we're just getting that, that medicine available for patients now. So we've been in a very constrained environment um, uh, while we've been uh, making that drug to make it more broadly available. The vaccines are faster. They're able to make them faster. And you, they're already treating in trials 30,000, 40,000 people. Um, so, uh, but that's the reason that we, we were able to get going a little bit more quickly. And now the vaccines and the antibodies and those other uh, treatments that people are testing are now coming online and getting into those, those clinical trials now. Yeah, so in fact, a lot of, um, and rightly so, there's been a lot of emphasis on developing vaccines. Um, and, um, but of course, vaccines may not be 100% efficacious. Well, we know that uh, from, from um, our experience with, with flu vaccines. And I wondered um, if you would discuss uh, efforts to develop uh, new, new in additional drugs to treat COVID-19 uh, and, you know, are, are, are there trials, you know, in addition to the dexamethasone, are there trials uh, being pursued to look at other drugs that are already on the shelf 
Mm -hmm. Are there efforts to develop new drugs to deal with some of the severe symptoms associated with COVID like cytokine storms? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so uh, yeah, certainly um, there's, there's a huge effort going on um, and uh, actually I, I've been involved um, in much of the um, industry has come together uh, to pull as many medicines that are on the shelf and test them to see if they might work. Um, against coronavirus. Um, to date, I, uh, the one consortium that I've been involved with, we've tested over 5,000 medicines and come up with really a very small number of what I would describe as off-the-shelf molecules that, that, um, that look like they have any antiviral effect, which is very different from what you said about cytokine storm, um, which isn't surprising in a sense because usually antiviral uh, medicines are really designed for that particular virus, right? They, they have to be really custom built. Um, it would be unusual. Uh, you've seen probably some testing of some, some medicines that were developed for HIV, for example, in, uh, for coronavirus, just thinking that if it's a, even a weak antiviral against this virus could have some benefit. And they generally haven't panned out, unfortunately. Um, there are a number of efforts going on for new uh, antiviral F medicines. There, there are um, at least a half dozen that I'm aware of that people are trying to come up with new antiviral medicines. Again, uh, I would call them the more classic antiviral medicines. So far, they're just very early. We don't, we don't know enough about them yet to know whether they're going to be safe uh, even at this point, much less effective. Um, they're early, they're moving forward though. There's one, for example, that Merck has that is in very early phase two testing. There are some other modalities that people have been testing which are antibody therapies. So you've heard about convalescent serum, which is, um, which I love because it sort of goes back to, you know, the old days of, of um, you know, we didn't know what was in serum, but we were giving it to people and it turned out it worked, right? Um, and so uh, convalescent serum, the, the data for convalescent serum are not great right now. They, they haven't really been able to show it, partly because it's been hard to run the trials. Uh, most of us believe that convalescent serum will have a benefit, um, and uh, we're waiting to see what that's going to do. Um, but now there are, because of the technology, people are able to make synthetic antibodies or monoclonal antibodies that are, that are directed at the virus as well. And those are being tested um, in clinical trials. Uh, I expect some of those studies um, will be reading out in the next couple of months where they'll be, they will have tested again, again against people who are infected to see if those antibodies can bring a benefit as well. Um, those would probably complement an antiviral, but probably be useful in the same patient population, which is people who are fairly early in their disease. Um, we don't, you know, the data for treating people who are more severely ill on mechanical ventilation in the ICU um, for antivirals and convalescent serum are not great. Um, by the time you get there, um, it is primarily the, I shouldn't say that we think, I, I don't want to be so definitive, we think it's primarily the cytokine storm, as you as you raised earlier, which is your your own inflammatory uh, system, in a sense, overreacting or reacting to the virus and causing a lot of the problems that we see in, in people. Um, their lungs filling with fluid, or getting fibrosis. That's probably the worst part of it. Kidney disease, neurological disease, all those other um, sort of collateral damage to the organs that happens from the immune system. The best therapy for that right now seems to be dexamethasone or the steroids. Um, those data look really good in the people who are a little bit farther along. There have been some studies for other medicines directed at, at um, cytokine storm uh, drugs on the shelf. Um, there are in particular um, two molecules directed against a cytokine called IL-6, which is an, uh, a cytokine that has been uh, associated with cytokine storm in particular in treatment of patients with cancer. So it's, this is a great example of sort of learning from one disease and, and putting it on to another. Uh, as we treat patients with cancer with immunotherapy, where we rev up the immune system intentionally, um, 
one of the side effects they get is this cytokine storm. And so we can treat that with IL-6 antibodies. Um, so the question is whether we could do that here as well, whether the, the same sort of cytokine storm was going on. Those medicines look modestly effective, I would say. They're not as, they, they don't seem to be as good as the simple steroids right now. Um, although the jury's still out and more studies are ongoing, um, the very early reads from those have not been as, as encouraging as we had hoped um, for those antibodies. Um, and then, of course, people are looking at completely novel ways of going after the virus, right? They're, they're looking at uh, very orthogonal approaches to um, the traditional either antiviral, uh, antiviral approach or anti-cytokine approach, um, uh, looking at supportive approaches and things like that. And, and there, the data are very, very early. We don't know. Um, lastly, you mentioned this on the virus side, on the, I'm sorry, the vaccine side. I hope we get to where we are with influenza. Hopefully we can get better than that. Um, I think that's what we're all hoping for. Um, uh, we have to see because as I mentioned earlier, we don't understand the disease well enough yet. So um, does um, uh, antibody uh, mediated immunity protect you? is the first question that we don't really know the answer to. So even if the vaccine works and you make antibodies or you make T cells, is that enough to protect you? We just don't know. If it is, how long does that vaccine work? How long are you immune? Is it three months, six months, a year, 10 years? Uh, and you know from, uh, as everyone who's gotten vaccinated, you know we get a flu vaccine every year because the virus changes every year. Um, you get a shingles vaccine usually just about once, right? When you're when you reach the age where you need a sh shingles vaccine or a chickenpox vaccine, you get it once and you're you're pretty much okay for the rest of your life. We don't know where vaccines for coronavirus are going to fall and whether different vaccines are different, right? Will behave differently um, because uh, vaccines are very simplistically. Everyone thinks of them as the same, but. Vaccines are actually very complicated as well. It depends on what part of the virus you, you are trying to make a vaccine against. Um, they're all different parts of the, the virus. The virus is very complicated. And so the vaccines are directed at different parts of the, of the virus. And we don't know which one is going to be more effective. And uh, if it's effective, for example, there was just recently, I, you're in Maryland, so you saw, you may have seen the Washington Post article on the mutations in the virus. Well, that's, that's against uh, the main mutation was something called the spike protein, which is on the outside of the virus. That seems to be mutating now. So if your vaccine is against that spike protein, if that spike protein can mutate and the virus is still infective, that vaccine may not be effective against the, the uh, mutated version of the, of the virus. I, I sound, this sounds really maybe doom and gloom. I don't mean it to. I mean to, I mean to sort of lay out the complexities of where we are in this, uh, just because we understand the underlying disease so poorly that understanding the, the potential for the therapeutics and running these, uh, these trials are really complicated. And, and we learn with each one that we do, right? Every, every trial that's run, whether it, with whatever modality, we learn more about the disease and more about patients and more about um, what's going on with patients. Uh, um, we were chatting earlier about the difference in uh, care across the world and how much of an impact that seems to have or the underlying diseases. Um, in the US, we found that people who are older or uh, obese um, may have higher risk factors. And so if you go to a country that has less obesity, for example, uh, we, we think there's less mortality there. there there's the, the mortality rate tends to be lower. Uh, and in Italy, when, the, when things went through, uh, when the virus went through Italy, we saw a very high mortality rate, presumably because it has a larger older population. So these are all the things we have to learn before we really understand how to, how to uh, battle this virus. So um, let's kind of... Uh pull away from discussing COVID-19 and uh, talk about drug development in general. So, you know, although obviously COVID-19 is a huge problem and we have to deal with it, other diseases still exist. Um, cancer. Um, so 
how has COVID-19 affected drug development in those directed toward those other diseases? So in a more general way. It's, it's, been, it's been a real challenge, um, you know, for, um, I'll, I'll give the Gilead experience, but also from my experience talking with colleagues around uh, and our investigators. So um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll predicate this by saying, you know, the, the way this usually works is that um, while we make the medicine and write the protocol, we work very closely with investigators, people who are the actual people, the physicians, who are the people who actually interact with the patients and enroll the patients into the trials. That's how I started, as I mentioned earlier, as a fellow um, in, uh, during my, uh, my uh, fellowship and my training, my early academic career. And so all of those investigators are uh, in hospitals, they're in uh, cancer clinics, they're in outpatient clinics, or they're in what we call phase one units where healthy volunteers may come. Uh, and uh, as you know very well, all of those places have been impacted. Uh, more importantly, all the patients have been impacted. If you are, um, some of the medicines we try to develop are for people who are very immunosuppressed. Their immune system is um, either uh, because of their diseases or because of their treatment, the immune system is compromised. Uh, bringing those people into a hospital or into a clinic to participate into a clinical trial um, is, has, is probably not wise right now. And, um, and we've had to make some very difficult decisions, both for studies that are uh, beginning, but more in, in some regards, studies that are ongoing. So if we have trials that are, that are year, uh, at least a year long, and we have patients who uh, are in that trial and who, for whom it's really not safe to have them ask them to come into the clinic. And so we've had to modify uh, working with the FDA and other regulators how we actually um, keep those patients safe during the trial. We've had to shift to telemedicine for a lot of things to make sure people are safe. Um, you know, and be very discreet about and careful about when they come in to be evaluated to get a blood test, for example, or where they go. And in many cases, we just have stopped. Um, there's been a long period where, um, uh, for example, in a lot of cancer studies, we've just had to put a, a pause on bringing people in because um, it uh, into a trial and what you're seeing, the way, and it's unfortunate because it's not just about the trials, you're seeing a lot of people with malignancies who are not being treated optimally, right? Because they can't come in, the clinics are closed, um, or they're only seeing some people. And so treatment is being delayed for those people, not even in trials, but treatment is being delayed. In cancer studies, a great example that you brought up, we are usually lead, um, uh, dealing with people who have exhausted most of their other options. Uh, people whose cancer has progressed despite the best treatments that we have. And so they often don't have time to wait. Um, if you are stage three or stage four uh, cancer, you can't wait until the vaccines are available to get your next treatment a year from now. You need to, you need to be treated now. So we've had to find this balance um, together again with the patients and the investigators of um, who needs to come in to be treated for their disease or put into a clinical trial as um, where the benefit, the potential benefit, I, sh I should say, outweighs, uh, outweighs the risk to the patient. And that's a very difficult, um, uh, very difficult balance to strike. And it's something we do um, in partnership with the physicians who are on the front line, right? And they're, they're the ones who are telling us, yeah, we probably don't need to do this trial, or we're, we're not seeing these patients right now, um, as opposed to, you know, these people, I can't afford to let them stay at home. They need to come in and be treated, and we, we need to keep this trial going because this is the last opportunity they have is to be on this experimental therapy. So it's been a real... Um, it's heartbreaking, honestly, in many ways. It's, um, you know, clinical trials generally are not done in people who are well, right? You have people who have run out of options, whether it's cancer or other diseases, um, lupus trials. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who don't have other options. And so finding that balance of trying to develop something for them that will have an impact on their lives and during COVID keeping them safe 
is um, is very difficult for for their the patients, their caregivers, and and us in terms of how we uh, how we have to approach it. Uh, and unfortunately, the net result has been that um, that things have slowed down. We've we've um, not been able to move as quickly. And I think it's the right thing, by the way. It is it is absolutely the right thing. Those studies that are ongoing, we believe, are the are the um, the most critical ones and the ones where the patients are the most vulnerable and need the options. And the ones that we've paused or slowed down are, are the ones where we believe that it's best for the patients not to come in. The last wrinkle on that is that it, it's, it varies tremendously by geography. Um, this uh, virus has peaks and valleys. And what we're seeing is that um, what may be true, I'll just use the US as an example uh, simplistically, but what may be true in Florida may not be true in South Dakota or may not be true in Northern California. And so uh, that, and our, all our trials are global um, uh, in general, I shouldn't say all, but in general, our trials are global. So we are right now, for example, able to enroll in South Korea. Uh, patients are able to come into the clinic very often um, it's harder in other geographies where, where um, the virus is, is um, more active. Um, Spain right now, uh, as the cases go up, uh, that has an impact obviously across the board. Uh, and this dynamic of people wanting or needing to stay home changes sometimes week to week. Um, and so that has, a real, that has a real impact as well. Yeah, it makes it, makes it very difficult to plan trials because you don't know when the next peak will arrive or in a particular where. geographical location. Um, so, but back to trials. So one of the, one of the um, sort of big news pieces in the last few weeks has been this, the Johnson and Johnson trial, uh, or not the Johnson and Johnson, the, uh, the well, it is a big, that's big news. Uh, that's going to enroll 60,000 people in seven countries. Right. Uh, is that on, would that be on the scale of clinical trials? Would that be considered unusually large? So, um, for example, if you were uh, looking at a drug or investigating a drug for uh, for uh, cancer treatment, would the scales be that the scale of the uh, trial be that large? No, I, I you know the, the there are really a, a few things that drive the scale of a study. Um, the first is um, the, how common the disease is, and that's something people don't think about often. Um, in many trials with rare diseases, I don't have any trials, um, there are many diseases that are very rare. There are only sometimes only a few hundred people in the world with that disease. And so those studies can be very small, um, uh, but those are really the exception. In general, there's, there's sort of a, almost a minimum bar um, of uh, patients that we all believe we need to, to um, evaluate. And it's primarily driven by safety. You don't understand fully the safety profile of a medicine until you, uh, you have more patients who've, who've taken it. Um, uh, some of the adverse events that happen are rare. They happen in let's say 1% of patients. Well, 1% of 10 people versus 1% of 1,000 people are very, is a very different uh, frequency. You may never see it early. Now we, uh, as I described earlier, we go from small to big so that we make sure that if something is happening in 10% of people or 20% of people, we know that early, you can figure that out. Something that happens in 0.1% of people, you, don't, you can't figure that out until you're in thousands of patients. Um, in cancer studies, we don't, uh, we don't need to uh, usually treat people who are that big. I, I, that's a generality, I would say. But in a disease like um, the other driver is the ability to see if you're having a benefit. And uh, breast cancer is a, is a great example of a disease where there's been an incredible amount of progress over the past 20 or so years. I, you know, I remember when I was a medical student, um, patients with breast cancer, you know, the outcomes were really poor at that at those days. Now um, we are, we're not done by any means. I shouldn't, I, I don't want to connote that, but 
we all know people who are survivors of breast cancer right now uh, because of the, the treatments that have come up in the past 20 years. And so when you stu study women with breast cancer, uh, for example, that um, where uh, right now for hormone receptor positive, um, small tumors, uh, uh, the survival rate, the ability to do well with uh, breast cancer, most people at five years, it's somewhere in the over 95% range that people survive, right? And so those studies have to be very large if you want to show a benefit over 95% uh, survival. If you want to go from 95% to 98% survival, you need to look at thousands of people to show that benefit. Um, by contrast, in pancreatic cancer, there's really very few options. And there you can um, usually know with you know, maybe a couple of hundred patients um, whether or not that drug is, is, brings the right benefit risk ratio, right? Whether you're improving life or extending life enough um, to uh, warrant the risk that any, the medicine brings. And, th and so the way to think about it is it's really that benefit risk ratio that you're always trying to uh, bring. So vaccines are a unique case of benefit risk. Um, the benefit here is protection. You're not treating a disease, you're protecting against a, a disease. And the risk uh, uh, may be real. You may get adverse events that are, you don't want to cause in, in a broad population, right? If, even if it's 1%, um, you may not want to cause some of those effects. And mostly it's unpredictable what those effects might be. And so for that reason, in order to fully understand the benefit and the ability to protect people and to really understand the safety, in vaccine trials, usually you have to go mu much broader and, and uh, evaluate a much bigger population of people. Um, so for vaccine trials, it's fairly typical then to go to the tens of thousands of patients um, range to, to, to look for efficacy. You know, usually it's in the 10 to 20,000 range, uh, depending on the infection that you're looking at. In this case, I think 50, 60,000 for the vaccine trials is going to be typical um, right so, now. Um, so I think you've made it pretty clear that it's, it's difficult to carry out these clinical trials during COVID-19. And I was reading a piece the other day where um, uh, the author suggested that this might be an opportunity to rethink how we do clinical trials. Uh, and that is um, now you, uh, for the most part, my understanding of trials is you, you, you go to a clinical center, you're part of a, a, a study that is housed in that clinical center. Uh, and what, what these authors suggested is that maybe this is an opportunity to design trials that are more dispersed, yeah. but would, as you alluded to, would require using telemedicine to monitor the progress and presumably the compliance of, of uh, volunteers. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it's something that, that we have been trying to move uh, to uh, more and more um, uh, over the past many years. Uh, it, it is one of the more um, uh, difficult parts of doing the clinical trials is that you need investigator sites where everything is done at that site. And so by necessity, what that means is you are restricted in terms of the patients that you're drawing from to patients who may be at that specific site. Um, so there's been a, a large effort ongoing for many years to, to distribute the trials more. Um, and uh, the difficult balance there is um, that two things. One is that when you bring people in, you can uh, you can get a lot better feel. You know, Zoom is fine. Yeah, but it's, it's but limited. Same, right? and especially when you're evaluating a patient, it's not the same. You know, I remember, you know, I, I as a pulmonary doc, I used to have um, a lot of patients with emphysema, and they would come in, and and I would say, you know, have you stopped smoking? And they would say yes, and then I would look at their fingers and see the nicotine stains on their fingers, and you know, and I, I could judge whether or not they were being entirely forthcoming with me. Um, so there is, you, you miss a lot from telemedicine. The other thing you can't do is to do blood tests, you know, CAT scans, uh, 
you know, those sorts of tests that really do require the laying on of hands, um, you can't do those remotely. But there are things we can do from, from a technology standpoint, what I would describe sort of as the back end of clinical trials that will allow us to distribute much more broadly. And uh, what's happened during coronavirus has really allowed us to really take a, a step function in terms of that. We, are, um, we did what we call, uh, it's a, called a simple trial. Uh, what we were able to do is to go to literally hundreds of sites. Usually for a trial, you have you maybe have tens of sites in the tens, maybe low hundreds. We were go, able to go to hundreds and hundreds of sites because we were able to streamline um, the back end of the clinical trial work and do it use technology to do things like monitoring the data. One of the things we do to make sure that the data uh, collection is done well and that it's complete is we have to monitor those data. And so we can do that now remotely, much more, much better than we used to be able to do. When I started, you had to go to the site, pull all the paperwork down and make sure everything was, was correct. Now we can do a lot more of that remotely. So it is, I think in large part, will be part of the future. And I think what it will do, the, the real upside of it will be in the sense it will democratize the ability to be in, in, in a trial. Um, the, the people who are eligible and uh, able to be in trials. We have had in clinical trials in general, and this is industry, it's academics, it's everyone, a very difficult time accessing communities of color, for example, in clinical trials. Um, there are a number of factors behind that, but we really understand that we have to enroll those patients in order to understand the disease, whether the, the disease is different and whether the treatment works in those patients, right? Those are two very different questions. Uh, if we can't enroll the patients, we can't answer those questions. And so we've, for many years, been pushing very hard, and this could be part of the solution here to, in a sense, democratize and make more broadly available um, trials to, to patients with cancers that can't be treated otherwise with potentially new uh, experimental medicines as, as an example, or in our case here, treating um, uh, people with, uh, with COVID. We've been very um, gratified, I should say, you know, I guess is the word when in, in the trials that we have done, the representation of African Americans and Latino people in the U.S. has actually been, uh, it's not optimal, it's not as great as we like, but it's much more representative of the of the U.S. population than almost any other clinical trial that I've been involved with, so that you see in other, other indications. It speaks to the need, but it also speaks to how this democratization can allow us to answer those questions better and understand um, how does race or ethnicity impact your disease, and how does that impact your, your ability to be treated uh, with that disease. So, um, there are a lot of benefits to us potentially being able to do that. Um, so I'm, I think we're all excited that that may be something we can, we can do. It's hard. It's, it's very challenging. In fact, that was one of the silver linings that was suggested by these authors, that it would provide an opportunity to broaden representation in clinical trials, which is very important. Okay, uh, I think we're just about up uh, with, um, with this discussion. Or finished with this discussion, but I have one final question. And that is, since we're at a university, I wondered, and there's a lot of basic research going on at this university, how can university researchers contribute to this uh, drug development um, process, either directed toward COVID, but other diseases? It's a great question. And again, I came from there, right? I, so that, that's sort of my background as well. I, I'd say there, there, there are several ways. Um, I think for, um, for the clinical people, people who are, who are clinicians, I think uh, becoming an investigator um, or getting involved in clinical trials is, is huge. And in particular, if you're someone who sees, represents, takes care of communities of color, um, it is uh, that that I think in particular is a, is a great way to contribute and be involved in um, in those in whatever your specialty is. Every disease has unmet need. Every disease has um, clinical trials that are ongoing, not just COVID, but hypertension or you know stroke or uh, malignancies. So I think that's one area. 
But, um, and so, uh, you know, I would say for us, we work with academic medical centers as a big part of what we do, especially in things like cancer. But even here for COVID, those big academic medical centers are, are the places where we, uh, we know we can uh, work best. The best inv investigators are there. Um, they are uh, they're experienced in doing clinical trials and, and can, um, uh, you know, know everything from how to do informed consent to how to collect data. So we work very closely with academic medical centers across the board. Um, I think though for the, on the basic side, we, we also work very closely with them. And, and you know, I think we, uh, we know that really uh, basic science is the root of anything we're gonna do from a therapeutic standpoint. Um, I had the privilege when I was um, uh, doing my PhD, um, I was doing immunology, but I was working in a virology lab and this is in the, in the 80s. Um, and it was sort of at the height of the HIV uh, pandemic, which unfortunately continues. Um, those virology labs had existed doing basic research on viruses that nobody cared about. Who had ever heard about a retrovirus, right, before the HIV outbreak? And um, the fact that they existed and that basic science existed allowed for there to be uh, uh, the ability to learn and, and make an impact in HIV within years instead of decades. We didn't have to start from scratch. Um, similarly, as I was describing earlier with, with coronavirus, this virus didn't exist a year ago. It's the, the basic science and the work that everyone had done at risk for the past decades that, allowed, that has allowed uh, us as a, as a community, as a society to react. If we hadn't invested in understanding vaccines, I'll put the medicines aside, if we hadn't understood vaccines or the basic science of immunology, um, we, weren't, we wouldn't be able to respond the way we, we've been able to respond. And we can't make breakthroughs in, um, in things like malignancies without understanding that under, underlying biology. That is the predicate to everything else that we do. Um, I work a lot with um, academic researchers doing basic research who are looking to, and the term we tend to use is translate, translate that biology to a therapeutic. Sometimes they've discovered a pathway or a biology that they believe is going to be impactful in, in a disease, but they don't have a medicine to treat to use to treat. And so we can work, um, uh, we, and I mean broadly, I, those of us who do clinical development, whether it's NIH or, or industry or whatever, work with those basic researchers to maybe um, develop molecules, uh, whether it's an antibody or a small molecule against that pathway to test that hypothesis. And uh, we, I also work with a lot of folks who have uh, early molecules that they've worked on. They found the pathway and they have found the molecule. They've tested it in animals. Um, and, uh, and we can help those people move those molecules forward because of the, the cost and the infrastructure and the difficulties that we've just been talking about around running those trials. Um, you know, we, we partner often with, with uh, our academic colleagues. We view them as critical to where we go. Uh, and what we do, and that's been the, at the root of a lot of our success. So I, I think those are the two best ways to interact. Well, I'd like to thank you again for your time. This has been a very enlightening discussion, uh, and um, we're going to leave. Uh, we're going to open up the floor to to questions. If you have any, if you, anyone in the audience has questions, you can just enter it through the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Um, we're going to start out with questions. If anyone has any more, submit them through the Q&A. Um, we're going to start out with some about remdesivir, and then we'll move to some broader questions. So the first one um, comes from our participant. Is there a randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled trial plan for remdesivir in mild or moderate cases? So, yes. Yeah, so the, the, the NIH, NIAID, it's called the ACC trial, ACT trial, uh, is a randomized placebo-controlled um, trial. And because that study was started early, um, and as I mentioned earlier, we didn't know who was going to be 
uh, affected, it, it includes a very broad uh, group of patients and uh, including ventilated patients in the ICU as well as patients who are in the hospital but not didn't require oxygen. So it's a very broad group. Um, in those early trials, what we found is that the, the patients who seem to show the best benefit are those who are uh, need low flow oxygen, um, but not that, that, that have not been uh, mechanically ventilated. We weren't able to show a, a benefit in the patients who are um, uh, you know, not on uh, any oxygen. And there are a number of reasons for that. One, there weren't that many of those patients in the trial. And two, those patients don't, um, by and large, don't get that sick. Um, what do I mean? You have to think about the population as a whole. Of every 100 patients who get infected uh, with the coronavirus, we think it's roughly about, you know, it's a single digit percentage, probably in the, in the 5% range that end up in the ICU. A lot of people are asymptomatic. A lot of people who are infected who feel sick, get better on their own. And a lot of people who are uh, on that cusp of losing and the main symptom, the main sign that we see is a lot, uh, a lack of oxygenation or the inability to get oxygen in the, the lung pathology that happens. Many of those people get bad and then they get better on their own. And, um, and the mortality rate is not that high in those people and the morbidity rate's not that high. We are now moving to um, an outpatient setting to study those patients um, and to see if remdesivir is going to have that in a randomized controlled way. Those studies are uh, getting underway and they will take a lot longer because now you have to, instead of enrolling, you know, 100 patients who, um, you know, have a high morbidity and mortality rate, you have to enroll 1,000 patients who have less severe disease and many of whom will get better on their own, many of whom will, you know, the placebo um, response in those studies will be high. So to, to show a benefit, um, you have to collect enough events, as, as, as we describe it, to show. So we are starting those studies. Um, we are starting them with the IV version of the, of the molecule, but you can imagine that has challenges in that if you're an outpatient, uh, coming in uh, to get an infusion is, is a bit of a challenge. That's where remdesivir is not ideal. We want to make it, uh, we want to know if it works there. So that's the, the experiment we'll do. And we're going to work on other approaches with remdesivir and with other medicines that could be easier for people to get. Um, sometimes we think often about maybe what our reality is, which is, look, I'd be happy to go to get uh, somebody to give me an IV for a few days. But um, when you look across you know, rural areas or outside the US, that's not practical. And so we're trying very, very hard to come up with another way of uh, getting remdesivir to people. Making it oral is a very difficult uh, thing. We, we, we're not sure we can do it. We're working hard to do it. That would ob obviously change things. So the yeah. answer, short answer is yes, it's much more complicated than that though. So one of the follow-up questions uh, is related. Um, Daniel O'Day mentioned that Gilead is thinking of moving IV remdesivir to the outpatient setting. If you, God forbid, happen to get COVID-19, is outpatient IV remdesivir something you would feel safe taking? Um, yeah, I, I, I gotta be careful because we haven't tested it that much. So I'm not, you know, I, I can tell you personally um, from what we've seen from the, um, from the safety data so far, and you can read the New England Journal article and those sorts of things. Um, from a safety standpoint, I, uh, I think we are, um, the adverse event profile that we're seeing, and I don't want this to be a remdesivir, you know, talk, so I just want to be careful about, um, about where we go with this. But um, personally, I would certainly feel comfortable going into a trial with that and recognize that the trial is where we will understand better the benefit and the risk of getting remdesivir, IV remdesivir as an outpatient. So those, as I mentioned, those trials are just getting started. Um, and uh, certainly um, if I got it, would I enroll in that trial? Yeah, I would definitely enroll in that trial. But I, I, you know, um, that's where informed consent becomes important. That's where understanding the safety benefit uh, profile and, and, and what you're comfortable doing is a very personal decision at that point. 
Our next question comes from Kyle Seelman. He says, we've recently been seeing some long-term effects of COVID-19 in quote unquote recovered patients such as persistent cough and other problems. Have there been any results in remdesivir or other treatments showing that it helps curb those long-term effects? That's an excellent question. We were talking about that earlier. Um, the, there hasn't been very much work done on that, um, uh, partly because what you're describing is we're all learning that all at the same time, right? That, that there are, in recovered patients, there, there may be some longer term consequences. We don't really know why that's happening. Um, so we are, we are trying to understand that. Um, and as we now design our future trials, I think we, uh, Gilead, but also everyone else who's, who's doing these are, are going to start trying to see if we can assess that, see if we can figure that out. Right now, we don't know how many people might get those side effects. Uh, I'll call them side effects, you know, the, those other manifestations of the disease, when they come up, how often they come up, in who they come up. And so it makes it really hard to study those. But we are, we are starting to track that now, um, certainly, for example, in the outpatient study. And, and then the last, the last thing is we don't know whether uh, getting rid of the virus, which is what we do, or getting rid of the inflammation, which is what other medicines may do, is going to be what benefits those people because we still don't know, understand the mechanism for those things. The only hint we have, the only hint that I would say that we've seen is in the, in the uh, NIH uh, study that was done. The patients who got remdesivir compared to the patients who didn't get remdesivir. If you look at the adverse events that happened, the patients who didn't get remdesivir had more kidney damage than the patients who did get remdesivir. I would describe that as a hint. I, I, I would be way over my skis if I said that that was a therapeutic benefit in any way, shape, or form, um, but uh, because it wasn't an endpoint, it wasn't designed to look at that, but it's an interesting observation. Um, and so that gives us some confidence that um, we can, uh, that maybe remdesivir is preventing at least that kidney manifestation, uh, which has been a, a real problem for patients. Uh, we will assess that uh, prospectively, you know, and that, that's the gold standard is to go back and actually ask that question uh, as the primary question in a trial. And we, we haven't done that yet, but that's the only hint I would say that we have uh, that, that there may be something there. Our next question comes from Jerome Dances. He says, what's the status of the precursors to remdesivir, like GS441524? Public Citizen has suggested that it may have more potential for reducing mortality and saving lives against COVID-19 than remdesivir? Yeah, um, so it's a great question and one I get asked a lot. So that molecule is one step before remdesivir in the synthesis of, of remdesivir. Um, the challenge with that molecule, um, so it, you know, it's a molecule that we made at Gilead. It's, uh, it's a molecule that we chose not to develop because the remdesivir is better, or we believe it's better because, and the data are about very technical, but maybe there's a chemistry audience here, but it has to do with an extra phosphate that's on that molecule. We, um, the way it works, because it's a, um, a polymerase inhibitor, is it needs to look like uh, a triphosphate. It needs to be a triphosphate. Um, remdesivir, when we load it and we look at how much loads into the lung and into the lung cells, um, has a much higher triphosphate level than that, than that precursor molecule is, does, which is why we chose remdesivir. Now, we are going back, obviously, to reevaluate that, and we'll, we'll look at that, and it's something we're going we're gonna to test. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting hypothesis. It's good to speculate on it. The only way to know the answer to that question is to test it, and we're, we're, we're going to test it, and we'll see if we can show whether that precursor can have as good a benefit, not quite as good, better will, and if it's better, you know, we'd be crazy not to push it forward. So um, we, will, we, will, uh, we will determine whether that's true or not. 
in a related question um, related to GS441524 um, asks about it for treating feline coronavirus, which is a uniformly fatal disease. Um, the, the participant says that this molecule has been shown to treat feline coronavirus with a 96% cure rate. So his question is whether you have plans to advance um, to filing an IND with the FDA on that molecule. Yeah, so the FDA, so it's a, that's an animal um, uh, medicine. The FDA doesn't regulate uh, animal medicines. We um, have worked with, uh, and Gilead doesn't do animal health. Um, we, we just, uh, it's not something we do. We have partnered with others to, um, to make it available. I, I, and I, my understanding is, and I, I, I'm, again, this is me getting out over my skis. I don't know the details here um, because we've been so focused on human disease. Um, uh, that we've, I believe, I could be wrong about this, so maybe I won't, I won't uh, speculate, but um, uh, that we have worked with others to, uh, to make it available and actually establish that and make it available if that's the, if that's the, if it is that effective. Those aren't trials that we've run and they're not, um, uh, and they're not data that, that we have access to other than the publications that are out there. So, um, but we, we're not in the way of getting that approved or available to, uh, to um, uh, people who want to use it for, for um, uh, veterinary uses. All right, this is our last remdesivir question and then we can move on to some others. What does the manufacturing of remdesivir look like? Time frame, scale, and cost? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's why I, I think I mentioned earlier that, that um, it's taken us this long to make it. Um, we have spent since uh, since January. We spent um, uh, nine months before we knew Remdesivir was going to work. We started scaling up manufacturing. It's a very complicated synthesis for the chemists in the audience. It's a, it, it has um, many many steps. We've gotten it down from a nine month synthesis to about a six month synthesis. Um, there's a cyanide step in there. I'm not a chemist, but that's apparently the big bottleneck. There's a there's a step that involves cyanide in there. Um, and it, it also involves um, an excipient um, that has to go in to solubilize the, the, the medicine to make it available, which is very uh, difficult to make as well. Um, so we've gotten it down. Uh, we've spent about a billion dollars this year manufacturing the drug. We've gotten it down from January till now. We've gotten it down from nine months to six months. And um, the initial batch of medicine that we had that was on stock for the Ebola trials and things like that has been what, what has been made available and we donated and it's been out there and it was in the trials and as part of the EUA. We're just getting the new drug available. So starting at the end of August, that, uh, that drug um, is now vialed and has been uh, the EUA medicine. And we expect that by the end of the year, we will have about a million and a half patient courses available and we're continuing to ramp. We were just in a meeting yesterday around how much more we can we can try to make? So we're 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 pulling out all the stops. We have pulled out all the stops in terms of making it. It's just it's a very long lead time, very difficult supply chain. Do you think the virus uh, may possibly mutate to be more contagious or turn into a strain that requires a modification of vaccines and drugs? Yeah, um, I the um, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, I think the only hint we have right now is is um, this uh, mutation in that stock protein. Um, so uh, the my speculation would be that that mutation suggests that we may get um, it may make some of the vaccines or some of the antibody treatments less effective if they're directed at that stock protein. Um, for now, we haven't seen mutations in the polymerase, which is where remdesivir works and other antivirals may work. Um, and uh, certainly we haven't seen mutations in other parts of the virus that other vaccines may work against. Um, if the mutation rate picks up, a couple of things can happen with the mutation. One is that it can actually make the virus less infectious, right? Um, uh, so those would be, you know, not healthy for the virus, but good for us if that were to happen. And those viruses tend not to survive. The ones that are likely to survive are either the mutations that don't matter, but make, might make it harder to treat, or the mutations that make it more virulent, more, uh, more difficult to treat. Um, I don't think we know right now. I hope we don't get the more virulent ones, 
I think it's more likely that we'll get ones that will um, potentially get in the way of some of the antibody and uh, vaccine approaches. It's entirely possible that we see mutations uh, in the polymerase region that would not be unheard of. Um, uh, certainly, if you use the analogy of other viruses, that, which is where remdesivir works, which is why it's important. I think this is sort of the, the thing we're all hoping for. Look, I'm at home with my teenagers who are doing school here. We all want to get out of the house. Why we're all hoping that we have multiple wins here, right? I think what the way this is going to hopefully play out is that we have multiple vaccines, multiple therapeutics, uh, multiple approaches to um, tackling this virus so that as it mutates, it becomes manageable. Whether we end up in a place like SARS and MERS that it basically just goes away, or it becomes more like flu where you have to get your shot every year or every two years or whatever, we don't know. I think that really depends on how, um, what happens. And we'll learn that. Unfortunately, we're, gonna, we're learning it in real time along with everyone else. You have several questions sort of related to that and, and rolling out a vaccine. Um, so, you know, there's questions about, um, you know, there had been optimism about reaching a vac you know, creating a vaccine by this time, taking into account all the stages of vaccine development. When do you think we can expect one for mass distribution? We have a, a follow up to that asking what are the, some of the challenges that are going to come with the mass implementation. And then um, a, a, another question related to it, which talks about, um, you know, if side effects of vaccines aren't apparent for years, wouldn't it be wiser to flatten the curve, take precautions until we're confident in the vaccine rather than rush one for the end of this year? Yeah, really good questions and very complicated ones. And I, and I wish I had definitive answers on any of them. Maybe I'll, I'll do my best, though. Um, I'm, I'm surprised, uh, so we don't make vaccines, so I'm gonna give you, um, this is sort of an outsider's view in looking at this. I mean, I'm in the storm here, but not, uh, I'm not a vaccine expert. Um, I'm impressed by how quickly the vaccines have been uh, developed and now are available for uh, testing and, and um, really impressed by how quickly they've gotten it into, you know, tens of thousands of patients. I have friends and neighbors who've enrolled in trials. I actually, if I could find one, I'd go enroll in one. Um, uh, so ha having said that, I think the next step is actually knowing whether they work. Uh, what you read in the papers um, around some of the early data are around uh, the ability of the vaccines to generate an antibody response, for example. What I don't know yet, and I don't think any of us do, is whether that antibody response will result in protection from infection. We just don't know. Um, so that will take a little bit longer, and, and you can't really rush it because you need time, right? You need to uh, vaccinate enough people, wait to see the virus, right? You're going you're gonna to see what happens naturally, and then see, compared to people who get placebo, how many people who got vaccine got better. That just takes time. You can't, you can't accelerate that. The next challenge, I think, in terms of timing is scaling up a virus that works. Most companies are scaling up at risk, but you've probably also heard, no matter how much you try to scale up, very much like what we've been struggling with in terms of scaling up uh, remdesivir availability, scaling up to treat billions of people with the virus is just gonna take time. Um, we're, I think everyone is pulling out all the stops. I know anybody who can make vaccine right now is making it for one or the other of the companies um, that, are, that are developing these, these vaccines. But I think even when we get to, a, um, to one that, that is effective, let's say we take 10 into the clinic of those 10, how many will be in, uh, effective? One, will one be more effective than another? And then how quickly can you ramp that or those successful ones up? Will be a real challenge in the next year. I, you know, I, I don't mean to be, uh, I, I, I hear myself talking and it sounds more pessimistic than I am. Having said all of that, I do believe that getting a vaccine available broadly sometime next year, my guess, sometime next year should be very doable. Um, whether or not it's perfect in terms of longevity, I don't think almost, in, in many ways doesn't even matter. We can learn that as we go. It, it'll allow a lot of other things to happen. Um, in terms of the long-term effects, I think it's a great comment. Um, when you look across vaccines in general, though, most of the adverse events that happen for vaccines really happen early. There are rare events that can happen farther out, um, you know, years out. 
but in general, um, most of the most of the most of the negative things that are going to happen happen early, and they're usually mild. But that's what we're testing, right? That's the testing that's going on in the in the clinic right now. And so there, you then you have to manage. You have to figure out what the risk and benefit is, right? Um, uh, there's an assumption behind that question that we're all going to get herd immunity and be fine, and uh, that'll happen faster than the vaccines available. I don't know that that's true. Uh, you know, the herd immunity really requires about a, you know well north of 70% infection rate, and if we allow 70% of people to get infected naturally, that's a lot of mortality. There's a lot of people are going to die for that. Um, so getting people vaccinated to get us closer to herd immunity seems like the right thing, assuming that those, virus, those vaccines are safe in the early days. But as with any therapy we do, there's a risk benefit. So there's a risk benefit to not doing anything and there's a risk benefit to taking the vaccine. We don't have enough data on the risk benefit of the vaccine today, but that's the, the collective decision we're gonna have to make uh, in terms of how we go forward once those data become more available. So following up on that, in addition to vaccine and drug production, is there any effort to address the weekend effect seen so clearly in the daily COVID-19 mortality rates? Yeah, I think, uh, do you mean, I, 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 I'm inferring from that question, it's, uh, it's the, um, you know, the, the, the Labor Day, everybody going to the beach kind of phenomenon, um, which I saw firsthand. I actually went with my family to the beach and, you know, we were very careful to wear masks and sit in, in our own little corner, and then there were people who clearly unrelated, not from the same household, having barbecues, and and it did, you know, it's it does concern me. Um, uh, you know, I, I do think that those are the public health measures that we have to continue to take to to prevent um, the spread as much as possible. Um, so masks, uh, social distancing, I think all those things that that we're all trying to do. Um, it really are going to be necessary to try to keep a lid on this. So, you know, you, you, the last question was about allowing herd immunity to occur, and this question is about preventing infection. And I, I'm much more in the we need to prevent infection uh, space just because of the mortality that, that I've seen. You know, um, people my age, you know, um, the mortality rate is not uh, insignificant. Um, so we, we really do need to, I think, uh, try to stay safe until there's better therapeutics. That's my opinion. So there's a delicate balance, it appears, between the speed of bringing medicines and COVID vaccines to market and distributing them. Um, confidence in the safety and efficacy trials and soon to be announced new stringencies of the FDA approval processes. Do you know what the FDA is putting in place and why? I don't know what the FDA is putting in place. Um, I, I know what, what everyone else knows from reading the newspaper. Uh, what I can say is my, our personal, you know, our experience with the FDA, um, you know, I've been working with them for over 20 years. I have not seen um, from the people in the office that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, I have not seen um, any loosening of their, their bar for safety and efficacy. They are, they are, um, uh, as conservative now appropriately as, as ever. I, I admire that group of people. They do a very, very difficult job and, and under now under enormous pressure. Um, but I have not seen any shift at the FDA firsthand. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I don't, I can't predict what might happen politically, but up and up until today, I haven't seen anything. So I, I hope I have a lot of faith in those people. Um, they, they do really hard work. I, one of my med school classmates was an FDA reviewer for many years. So um, I've been very friendly with, with that group of just individuals that are really good, uh, really good, very um, thoughtful, very um, dedicated group of people who, do, who really do great judgment and they start with safety. That's, that's sort of the, what I love about that group. They are really thinking about um, their role in, in, um, in protecting the public. So I hope they stick to that. For my sake, you know, I want to take the vaccine. I want my kids to get the vaccine. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that the, the bar doesn't change. We've got uh, two more questions. Uh, would you say drug development is a more collaborative or competitive field? Um, <clears throat> really good question. Uh, um, I would say in the days of COVID, 
it's been incredibly collaborative. It's been uniquely collaborative. Um, I'm part of a consortium of R&D leaders from virtually every company, every major company in the world. Um, we have been openly sharing data, molecules, uh, experience, know-how, resources, everything you can imagine. We meet once a week, sometimes twice a week. Um, everybody takes time out of their schedules and we, 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 are, uh, we are doing everything we can um, on, that, uh, on that front. Uh, we also, I think, collaborate really well with our academic partners and with investigators and uh, people who, uh, we depend on collaboration in the sense with experts in diseases because we can't possibly have every um, expert in every disease inside the company. So whether it's a rare tumor type or, or a rare disease, we depend on our collaborations with, uh, with people outside of the company. So I think there it goes well. When, when you're, if you're talking about uh, other medicines, you know, I think it is competitive, um, but I think it's a competition based on demonstrating that your medicine is better. Um, it's not a, it's not an, I wouldn't describe it as necessarily an unhealthy competition. It is, it is an effort to show that um, we can do better than what's already out there um, uh, in terms of treating somebody with a disease. And I think that's a, it's a, I would describe it more as a healthy competition and it gets us to a better place. It gets to those better medicines and the better uh, treatments that, that um, we're benefiting from. All right, and our final question, what have you learned through this COVID-19 experience as a chief medical officer that you're going to remember um, and or apply to treatments that you help develop in the future? Oh, um, well, I, a lot, I, there's so many things, but a lot of it is technical. Certainly I've learned a lot about um, what is possible. Um, you know, I think maybe, maybe um, probably that's a primary lesson is that we have worked in a, you know, we work in a, it's a highly regulated um, uh, environment in which we work and um, it, it's led us to be very sort of conservative by the book as we do our, um, our work. And I think the collaboration that we've had with um, uh, not just the um, investigators that we work with, but the regulators and others, um, in terms of defining where flexibility can be built into the, brought into the system to get to answers more quickly, to benefit patients more quickly when the need is so dire, um, has made me incredibly more um, optimistic, honestly, around, around um, what we can do as a community, uh, at, uh, in whether you're in academics or whether you're in uh, industry or, or regulatory or wherever. I'm much more optimistic that, that, uh, that we have a, a community of really great people who all want to do the right thing. And that, that, uh, I think that's probably been the biggest lesson for me. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Parsi. And thank you to Dorothy for your lively conversation. Um, I just want to say thank you everyone for joining us today and a huge thank you to all of our colleagues in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and the College of Computer, Mathematical and Natural Sciences. Um, I believe Dorothy wanted to join us to make one last point before we close out. So um, Dorothy, please go ahead. Um, I really li uh, liked the point, the final point made by Mayor Dad, which is the uh, just how optimistic we can be when we see all of the collaboration among scientists and how you can get things done uh, much more rapidly than you have in the past when you have to. And we've heard, this, I've heard the same uh, sentiment voiced by basic scientists who are now working on COVID-19. And would that we, this could continue and be one of the sort of uh, silver linings of COVID-19. And thank you, Murdad. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. Thanks again, everyone. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and everyone's staying healthy. And last but not least, go Terps. Have a great day.